Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to this Crash Course NASM Assembly Programming Tutorial. This video is going to get you close and comfortable with NASM Assembly. Here are some of the things we'll cover, including, but not limited to, why use assembly? What is NASM? Command line interface and compiling. Language syntax and memory addressing. Writing to and reading from the console. If statements, for loops, calling functions and returning values. Lastly, we're going to cover how to disassemble and read a C program. My name is Ellis Code. I create technical and entertainment videos. Please support the channel by obliterating that like button. All right, let's get started. It is 2022 and beyond. Why learn assembly? Well, the first reason is that every piece of code is literally condensed into zeros and ones. But before those zeros and ones, they're first made into mnemonics, and these mnemonics is assembly. Being able to read these mnemonics is essential to be able to understand software. The second re reason is that writing assembly allows you to create highly optimized code that can then be used in higher level languages such as C, C++, Python, and so on. And the last reason, mastering assembly means that you can better analyze programs, disassemble them to identify potential malware and exploits, reverse engineer a piece of software, or use it as a base to create your own language. I think that's pretty cool. NetWide Assembler, or NASM, is an 80x86 process assembler that supports a range of object file formats. The X in x86 is a stand-in for the processor number. And here's a list of supported object file formats. Above all, NASM is built to be portable and easy to work with. To install NASM on your machine, I'm assuming Ubuntu, use the following command. Okay, so when your assembly source code is ready for assembly, you can use the following. Where the dash F is the object file format, you can also use NASM dash HF in order to list out the file object formats available. Optionally, you can use dash O to specify a name other than what NASM defaults to, which is typically A.out. Finally, to get your executable, you'll need to use the LD or GCC file to generate the final executable. Note, however, if you use GCC, make sure the symbol main is exported from your assembly source code, otherwise you'll get undefined reference error. Lastly, here's what an example make file might look like for your project. This and other resources are available on solidscode.com slash blog. Check it out. All right, let's get into the meat and potatoes. A typical NASM source code will look like this. You have one or more directives. Then, because the kernel will provide your running program or process it with a virtual memory, you will need to specify different sections of your program using the reserve term section. There's a text section which is for code, a data section for initialized data, the block started by symbol BSS section for uninitialized data, and many others. The order in which you specify your section does not matter because when the binary is assembled, it will correctly map to the text section, data section, BSS section. Note, the BSS section does not generate any code, but only serves to block off memory with associated labels. Because NASM is line-based, each line can have an optional label. Most lines will have an instruction followed by zero or more operands. Take a look at these instructions. Note the pattern. After the instruction evaluates, it stores the results into the leftmost operand. So, the instruction move y's value into x will move y's value into x. Another example, the bitwise operation AND will take 
x and y, and then store the result calculation into x. The same for or, and so on. For any given instruction, there are three possible operands, a register operand, a memory operand, and an immediate value operand. Registers are the processor's primary workhorse. They essentially are variables that are built into the processor. And because of this, they are blazing fast. There are several categories. General purpose, RAX, RBX, RCX, and RDX. Index registers such as RSI, RDI, the base pointer, and the stack pointer. And then finally, there's the integer registers, which is your R8 through R15. These are 64-bit versions. Each of these 64-bit versions will have a 32-bit, 16-bit, and an 8-bit version. What was I saying? Memory. Memory addressing is often called effective addressing, as it is the memory locations that are referenced are an offset location to data, and the BSS sections. When an instruction requires two or more operands, the source and destination operands will never both be memory locations. Instead, there's an alternation. As you see, using square brackets around an expression means we're reading the contents or setting the contents of a memory location. Whereas, if we wish to get the address of the variable, we'll simply use one of the following. Notice the load effect address in this will mean we wish to read and move the address of my variable into the register RAX. Finally, immediate values. Immediate values are four types, numeric, character, string, or floating point constants. Numeric constants can be of any base, and you can use prefixes and suffixes in order to change up the base. You can also use underscore to break up really long constants in order to increase readability. Character strings are eight characters or more that are enclosed in a single or double quote string. Character constants are a maximum of eight bytes long and can be only used in expression context such as move something into another something. String constants are only used within the data and the BSS section. Now that we talked about syntax, let's talk about a process's memory in detail. Any program that runs is given an isolated continuous block of virtual address space like this. This address space, also called a logical address space, is not the same as a physical address space or RAM. Lastly, virtual address space is segmented into specific sections or segments. Starting from low memory, we have code section, data section, BSS section, the heap, and finally the stack. Fun fact, because process memory is virtual, a memory management unit, MMU, is responsible for mapping to and from process virtual address space to physical address space. Okay, okay, back to these virtual memory segments. So, these segments the exact ones you specified in your source code using the reserve term section. The heap starts after the BSS section and grows upwards towards higher memory. This is typically where you find data that is managed by malloc slash free or new and delete within C and C++ respectively. From higher memory, you have the stack which will grow downwards lower memory using last in first out method. The stack is responsible for tracking a process's function calls, a function's local variables, 
parameters and return address. It's worth mentioning that any instruction that refers to a memory address is implicitly using segment registers. So for example, any jump return call instructions is implicitly invoking the code section, while push, pop, call, return is using the stack segments. Let's write the C program in assembly. To do this correctly, we'll need to know the calling convention of C, which is available on my website. Check it out. So you'll be able to see that when you're calling any C-based library or any other function that you write, you typically want to place the first parameter in these registers, the first, second, third, and fourth, and so on. And that's if you have one to six pr parameters, However, if you have seven or more, then you'll then be pushing the parameters on the stack. Per the calling convention as well, you need to save your return value in RAX register. Now the callee function will need to save these set of registers in able to preserve the structure of the calling convention. And then if you're the caller versus the callee, there's two different sets of rules that you follow, and these two really mirror each other and complement each other well. And of course, on the website, there's an example for you to follow along with. All right, let's go ahead and top off this tutorial by writing this program with an assembly. We know that we're going to access scanf and printf, and so we'll go ahead and include those externs here. Next, let's define our function's prolog, which is represented by this curly braces here, and as well as the prolog, which is the closing braces down here. To do that in assembly, we'll need the following. So a function's prolog is represented by this signature here, and the ending of a function, the epilog, is represented by these combinations here. Leave is essentially the reverse of these two, where we're essentially moving the base pointer back into the stack pointer and then popping the base pointer back into the base pointer, the value back into base pointer. And then we return. Here we are reserving space for a local variable, which is going to be i here, but we'll get to that in a moment. Within here, we can have our body of the function. So let's go ahead and take care of this section here where we are creating some global variables that can then help us to print out the messages that we need. And we do that, and we do that here. We're defining the message that prompts the user to enter a number. And then while we're displaying the numbers, we are going to be using this format here. And then to read the number using scanf, we'll use this formatting text here. This number will hold the actual value that the user types in. So now let's go ahead and write the body of this function here. So we'll start off by printing this message to the screen to prompt the user. So we'll go ahead and use a setup to prompt the user for an input value. In accordance with the calling convention, we need to make sure that EAX is zeroed out for any function that has multiple parameters. In this case, printf has multiple parameters. And so we'll need to make sure EAX is always clear to zero. And next, we need to then load in the address of the message we want to display out to the first parameter register, which is always going to be RDI. And once we have that, we can go ahead and call printf. So that takes care of here. Let's go ahead and take care of reading characters or values from the console. So very similar to printf, so since scanf takes multiple parameters, we need to zero out EAX. And then we need to then specify the first parameter always in RDI, and then the second parameter in RSI. If there was a third, it would go into RDX, and then the fourth RCX, and so forth. So here's the first parameter. We load the address that we want to, display, uh, to format scanf with into RDI and then the memory address of where we want to store whatever the user types into, into SI, and then we call scanf at this point. Next, we'll need to take care of here by setting the local variable to zero. 
And that can be done by simply saying set zero into uh, the base pointer with an offset of negative four. Next, we'll go ahead and construct this for loop signature, the beginning and end of it. And we can do that pretty easily by using a label to signify the start of the loop. And then this is the end of the loop, which is gonna say compare the local variable against a register ECX. And this is gonna be used by us in order to hold the value of number temporarily. And then once we have that set up, if the comparison between the two is less than or equal to ECX, then go ahead and jump back up here and repeat the process again until the condition is no longer true. Next, we are calling printf once more, this time with three parameters. And so the third parameter will be the number that we wish to display. And then the second is the local variable i. And then the first one is going to be the message that we wish to display out. And now the only thing left to do is make sure that we don't have an infinite loop by incrementing i. And so here we are making sure that ECI is indeed holding the value of number and then making sure that we are always incrementing the local variable i by one so we don't have an infinite loop. And so at this point, we should be good to go. Let's go over to our console and make the project and then run it. Let's do this four times, and there we go. And so there you have it. We've covered quite a lot in this video. If you enjoy this video, you learned something, consider hitting the like button. It really helps out the channel. Until next time, thank you.